Good morning, Husker fans, and welcome back to the Husker Big Red YouTube channel. It's Friday, and your Nebraska basketball teams will be playing in the NCAA tournament today, so we are going to talk about that. Both matchups with the Texas A&M Aggies uh, coming up today in the first round of the men's and women's NCAA tournaments on Friday. Nebraska has a new athletic director. We have some contract extensions and uh, some wrestling and baseball action to cover this week. So lots of stuff going on in the world of Nebraska athletics. Um, and uh, joining me, of course, as always, is uh, Danny Gillette. And uh, how are you doing this morning, Danny? Good. I'm excited for today. It's been a busy week, never a dull moment in Nebraska land. And I'm, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. It's been a long wait, 10 years, in fact, since the Nebraska men's basketball team has played in the NCAA tournament. I can remember it well. They played Baylor. Um, it did not go well. None of their trips to the NCAA tournament have gone well. They've never won um, a game. So we're going to break it all down. Before we do, uh, make sure that you guys, if you haven't already, do us the huge favor and uh, hit the subscribe button on the channel. That definitely helps us out. Hit the like button. Get into the comment section. We appreciate all your feedback, whether it's positive, negative, or indifferent, I guess. Uh, <laughs> we just love to uh, you know talk with Nebraska fans you know, no matter what. So um, at any rate, it's been an interesting couple of weeks for Nebraska sports. We had the whole Trev Alberts thing, um, you know, right in the middle of March Madness. Then the Nebraska basketball teams get matched up with Texas A&M. Um, after that, Nebraska gets the new athletic directors and da-da-da. But uh, today the focus um, is on basketball. And, uh, you know, Casey Tominaga hitting the half-court shot yesterday it was kind of fun. You know, it was interesting to see, you know, uh, the pictures of, uh, you know, Sam Hoiberg with his dad back from the, the Iowa State days. It's all kind of come full circle. It just – Feels like the right moment for Nebraska basketball, but they still have to execute. Texas A&M is a very dangerous team, and as we saw yesterday, anything can happen in the NCAA tournament. I know what a fun first day, huh? I mean, this is what I, this is what I love about March Madness, and um, you know, I think um, when you look at some of the um, big names that kind of asserted themselves uh, in the first round, you had Duquesne and you had Michigan State, uh, really kind of leaving their marks early, so. You know, it's uh, people were kind of complaining about the Duquesne win early in the season. Oh, we got to stop scheduling these cream puffs and yada, yada, yada. Duquesne is no cream puff. And Michigan State, you know, they may slog through the regular season, but they always seem ready for March. And that's a testament to Tom Izzo. And he knows how to get his guys ready for the big moment. And, um, you know, a lot of coaches, <clears throat> John, John Calipari, <clears throat> seem to um, – fail in March, but Izzo always seems to have his teams ready. Yeah, it's not a, uh, the message board scene in Kentucky is not, it's it's crazy, man. I, there was one comment where the guy, I, I you know, this is message board, from message board geniuses, so if you want to check it out, it's pretty hilarious actually, but um, he said, this was a, just a Kentucky fan, but uh, he said, if John Calipari returns to Lexington, I'll make January 6th look like a kindergarten party. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> I mean, and that, that's not even the worst comment I saw. I'm gonna, <sighs> the, the worst one I saw, I can, like, literally cannot repeat on air yeah. or we we won't we'll lose our monetization. <laughs> but go check out Message Board Geniuses to feel how the Kentucky fans are feeling right now. But Kentucky yeah, fans I mean, are not happy. But, you know, when you run the dribble drive offense and, you, you know, it's that's the thing is – uh, especially in this COVID era, like there's a lot of old basketball teams and uh, Nebraska is kind of one of them in the sense, you know, just a lot of older players. And so some of that, you know, the, the dribble drive, I mean, the thing is that John Calipari has never been a tactician. He's never been a great coach. He's just always got talent and he's always relied on talent. He's always been a bag man. He was a bag man as an assistant, you know, uh, so that that's just who he is, that he's, he's basic. And that's like, Nick Saban and Kirby Smart, like Nick Saban was always talked about, like, oh, he's a super genius. He's not. He just recruited the best players. Like, so that's that's where it is. I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but, you know, at, at the end of the day, like Fred Hoiberg is 10 times the basketball coach that John Calipari is, just in terms of X's and O's. But Cal's done a great job of, you know, getting the best. I mean, if you get Derrick Rose and, you know, you can buy off those guys and get the best talent, then it doesn't matter if you run a middle school offense. But, I will you know. say that he did a good job of bringing relevance to uh, UMass basketball out here back in the early 90s with Marcus Camby. And, yeah, man, know, got Marcus guys. Camby that bag, buddy. You know yeah, mean? he did. And, <laughs> you know, he, he, he made the Minutemen a fun, a fun watch. But, you know, it's just so interesting to see, you know, who steps up in March. I, I always um, liked Oakland as far as the Tarantino goes. Jack Golke was 
sensational last night. He went to the same high school as uh, Nebraska commit Nick Janowski. So maybe that's uh, boding well for the future. And uh, so anyways, getting into this matchup today with Nebraska, you know, Texas A&M, Buzz Williams is the head coach. It was, you know, they were, they, they didn't seem to really take much too seriously. They were kind of mocking Casey Tomonaga in their pregame uh, practice yesterday. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, you know, just from some observers on Twitter, they noted that Nebraska was much more organized, much seemed much more professional, where Texas A&M was just kind of, you know, just organized, disorganized chaos. But, um, you know, I think like their athletic director. Yeah, and I think it's what you're what you're going to see on offense from Texas A&M. This isn't going to be – they're not going to see them run a bunch of sets like Nebraska. They're going to they're going to dribble the ball up, and they're going to ball screen the hell out of it. That's what they're going to do. They're going to ball screen, ball screen, ball screen, ball screen, ball screen, and they're going to attack the basket. They're going to try to kick and drive, and that's what they do. They basically shoot all of their shots either at the rim or from the three-point line. So the defense is going to have to be on point. The rebounding is going to have to be on point, and – I, I am worried, though. I really am worried about how Nebraska is going to guard, you know, Wade Taylor. Um, just because, you know, I'm thinking about their ball screen. You know, I'm looking back at that Michigan game and Doug McDaniel, Michigan's a very heavy ball screen offense. He's a similar type of dynamic point guard. And you know, he absolutely went off on Nebraska the first half. And Texas A&M's got to be, you know, watching that film. Like, how can we, and they don't really need to do anything different. They already run that similar type of offense. So that if, if there's one. Huge concern to me is that Wade Taylor is going to go, you know, for 30 or 40 points, and it's not going to matter what else Nebraska does. So th their ball screen defense and their offensive rebounding are my two big concerns going into this matchup. Yeah, the rebounding is certainly a big, um, a big concern for me as well. Don't allow second opportunities and second chance points, uh, because if you do, then that, you know, doesn't lead you into a, a favorable matchup. I mean, you can't allow these guys to get second chance points by way of rebounds. You got to make sure to secure the rebound and also, you know, control the pace of play. I think that's one of my keys. Play your style and your speed of the offense. Don't play to them because all the times Nebraska's play to their opponent in terms of speed of the offense and how quickly they run things, then it's just gotten them all out of rhythm. So play to your speed, control the pace of the game, and make sure to do a good job of cleaning things up off the glass. And then, um, you know, offensively, I guess a big key is, uh, you know, one of the Texas A&M uh, players basically said, you know, Nebraska lives by the three and dies by the three. And, you know, he's not wrong. Nebraska really no, does live and die by the three. They um, they make nine and a half three pointers per game, which is one of the top in the NCAA. They lead the NCAA or they lead the Big Ten, excuse me, in three point makes per game. And if you look at Texas A&M, that is a huge weakness of theirs, um, especially on the defensive side of the floor. Um, you look at their opponents, they average 8.8 .8 three-point makes per game, which is 339th in college basketball. Um, the opponents are also, um, you know, basically shooting 33.9%, uh, which is outside, you know, the top 200. And uh, they're giving up, you know, 26 three-point attempts per game, which ranks 347th. So Nebraska's going to get three-point looks today. It's just Basically, you know, if you look at Texas A&M's defensive philosophy, that's just they believe in defending the rim more than they, you know, believe the three-point line, which, I mean, they're not unique in that, but they really kind of emphasize it. So they, uh, you'll see them kind of, you know, watching in their highlights if anybody's watched them. Um, they're, they're kind of always chasing out for contested shots. So, I mean, I'm sure they'll be really focused in on Casey Tominaga like Illinois was. You know, I'm sure that's going to be a focal point, but other guys are going to get open looks and they have to hit them. Um, you know, Juwan Gary, you know, CJ Wilcher's supposed to be back, Jamarcus Lawrence, you know, Bryce Williams, uh, Rank Mass. I mean, they just, I, I don't know how else to say it, but if Nebraska doesn't, I, I don't think that they have to make more three pointers than Texas A and M because Wade Taylor can get hot. He can make six by himself. So you know, I could see a situation where Texas A and M does make ten, but Nebraska's got to be in the. They got to be, you know, in the eight to ten range, in my opinion, to have a chance to win this game because I just don't see them scoring enough. You know, without the three point shot going in. Well, we saw you know last Friday in in Nebraska's win against Indiana how successful they were. With the three-point shot we also saw what happened the following day when the three-point shot didn't go in against illinois and so it was kind of an interesting juxtaposition between the two and so for me it's yeah like kind of like kind of like you said it's going to be up to the other guys to get involved and i'm and i'm looking at bryce williams again to have a good game and get hot early i mean because tomanaga will get his points i think and you know 
Um, Texas A&M, you know, they're very clearly, you know, going to be watching him and guarding him closely and throwing everything they can at him. So it's up to the supporting cast uh, to really kind of set the tone and make sure that, you know, everybody's firing on all cylinders. And I know that doesn't sound, you know, particularly easy, but we saw it happen against Indiana on Friday. Everybody contributed in some way uh, versus Saturday. You know, everybody kind of went cold. And so this is going to need to be a game of the supporting cast, and hopefully Tominaga can get hot early as well. I'm not expecting him to just because there will be so much defensive attention uh, placed on him, but I'm hoping he does. I still think, you know, that's the thing is, yeah, you look at Nebraska, it's going to be hard to to guard them, but Texas A&M also is not, you know, what I would call a great defensive team. They, you know, in terms of, you know, their point per possession rating, they're 201st in college basketball. Um, So they, you know, they're 141st in terms of points allowed, so kind of in the mid range. They do they do a good job of forcing turnovers, 11.9 per game. But um, yeah, I, I just feel like I feel like Tominaga he, he's going to get some looks because that's the thing is Fred is a tactician and he does know how to run stuff. So I mean, if you try to take and that's the thing about Tominaga is a lot of teams you know will lull the, lull themselves into thinking oh he's just a three point shooter. If you overplay him at the three point line, he will kill you with backdoor cuts mm-hmm. and screens and 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 movement. So um I think that Fred's gonna have a great plan for him and they do need to get KSA going. I, I don't see them winning this game if, if KSA's right. not in double figures. That's just he's their best player. He, you have to show up in March, you know, to to I mean to win these games, you have to have your best players, you know, show up in the big moments. I mean look at you know Kansas last night was down one of their best players. And, you know, Hunter Dickinson, a former Michigan Wolverine, which breaks my heart, but 19 points, 20 rebounds, and five assists. That's what – he's the reason that Kansas is still playing. So those are the kind of performances that you need. And, you know, obviously I'm not saying that Tomanong needs to do that, but he needs to he needs to hit, you know, a big shot or two. Just more on the fact that, you know, it seems like when he gets going, this team gets going as well. So, you know, he, it's going to be a big factor, a big X factor, I think, Kase Tomanaga. Absolutely, and I'll be interested to see how that game is officiated. Not that I think it's going to you know, control the outcome of the game like it did last Saturday, but also it'll give us a better idea of, you know, can we drive to the hoop without getting hacked? Do we have to kind of, you know, shoot the three-point shot a little bit more because we're not getting the calls inside? Um, you know, how is this game going to be officiated? That's going to be interesting to see because – you shouldn't change your game based off of the officiating, but if you know you're not getting any calls inside, for example, you know, maybe, you know, shoot the three point shot a little bit more as well. Yeah. And like I said, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, I am interested to see the lineup slash defense that they use, um, you know, to start the game because Texas A&M does go a little bit smaller. Um, but, you know, Josiah Alec is is their best rim protector. So I don't see how you can take him out of the game because Texas A&M or wants to attack the rim. And so it doesn't make much sense to not have him out there because not only, I mean, in terms of shot blocking, but just the way that he, you know, is able to go straight up. Um, another thing about him is that I feel like in ball screen actions, you know, he's a good enough athlete to stick with guards and he does a great job of, of you know, moving his feet, picking up the guard and not fouling. So I feel like, you know, he's an essential piece to the defense. So I'm not exactly sure how they're going to match up with Texas A&M. I feel like that means that, you know, Tomonaga is probably going to have to obviously guard either, um, you know, Wade Taylor or uh, Rashford, I believe the other guy's name. Um, Rashford, excuse me. I'm thinking of a soccer player there for a second. Um, but he's going to have to guard one of those two guys. So, you know, but at the other end, <clears throat> they have to guard Kase too. And that's with, I made this point on um, X during the Illinois game, but, you know, one of the best things, I thought that they could do with with Terrence Shannon on him is just run him through a bunch of screens and because that's what guarding Kase is, is. He wants to he wants to run off screens, come off screens, catch and shoot. So it'll be, you know, interesting in the sense that he can be a defensive liability, but he's also going to wear out whichever guard is going to have to you know pick him up on the other end too. And I'll be interested to see how much Sam Hoiberg plays tonight because I think he's one of the better defenders uh, on the team. So yeah, I'd expect him to play a lot. Yeah, I'll be I'll, I'll be interested to see how much of a role he has. And like you just alluded to, if I, you know, if I was Fred, I would play him a lot because he is probably one of the more aggressive, you know, defenders and he can defend the perimeter well. So um, I expect to see a lot of him um, tonight. Yeah. Him and Lawrence are going to be huge. You have to, and you have to have good guard play. It doesn't matter, you know, in the NCAA tournament, the teams that get good guard play advance. So Tominaga, Lawrence, you know, Sam Hoiberg, those guys are going to have to step up and play big roles. So, um, 
yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. Um, you know, this matchup, I, I just feel like it's one that really is a 50, 51. Nebraska is a one point favorite. Um, we're on what TNT at five forty central time, I believe is the tip off. So make sure that you guys, uh, you know, get your, get ready. I know that Nebraska fans aren't going to be missing this since it's been such a long time, um, since we've made it, but hopefully, uh, they will get, you know, the win tonight, but, um, Let's get into prediction time here. We've kind of broken down this matchup. You know, there's the Trev Alberts factor. There's, a, there's a, you know, kind of. He'll be there, though, so that's good. Oh, he's not going to be there? Okay. No, he's not going to be at the men's game. I don't know about the women's. Okay. Um, no surprise. But, uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not surprised either. He's a he's a chicken, you know what. Um, but at any rate, what's the what what's your prediction, Danny, for uh, Nebraska, Texas A&M? Huskers are a one-point favorite. 87, 82, Texas A&M. Okay. Um, why, why do you think um, – explain your reasoning. Because Casey's going to get exposed on defense, and I don't know if um, – I don't know if we have the – enough of a defensive, you know, presence in order to stop those two guards. You know, I think those guards are actually explosive. I think we have enough inside, but on the perimeter, I don't – I could see certain combinations and certain play calls that can really kind of, you know, tilt the matchup in their favor. Um, I just don't have a good feeling about those two guards. And I don't have a good feeling about Tominaga defending. Yeah, I can see that. Um, like I said, it's going to be a 50, 50 game. It's going to come down to who is making shots. Who's making tough shots. Is it Wade Taylor or is it Casey Tominaga or is it, you know, CJ Wilcher? I mean, that basically that's what it comes down to is they're, they're going to have to make tough shots. Um, and at the end of the day, I still think that this Nebraska team <clears throat> is going to win because I think that they're they're the better defensive team. I think these two teams are both, you know, kind of fickle offensively. But I think for, you know, for 40 minutes, I trust Nebraska more on the defensive side of things. I am worried about their defensive rebounding. Um, but I just think that Texas A&M is too, um, you know, they're, they're too – Two one on one. It's too much one on one stuff, and I think Nebraska is a better team. Um, I think offensively they're going to get good shots, and I think they're going to make about ten three pointers, and I think that's going to give them enough to get a seventy nine seventy two win. Um, that's what I predicted at huskerbigred.com um, in my prediction, so I'm going to stick with that. But I definitely, <clears throat> I do think that's a very real possibility. Your prediction of uh, you know them losing, and it's to me, it's really about like Wade Taylor. I think I think Wade Taylor could score you know, like 25 points, maybe 30, and Nebraska could still win this game. But, I mean, if they get to a point where they score like 40, where he scores like 40, then, uh, you know, then I, I think that that's where, you know, it could be what you're thinking where Texas A&M could win. So very, very possible. Um, I'm just, uh, you know, I'm a Kool-Aid drinker at heart, and I just I feel like that just with everything that's happened with Trev, um, this matchup with Fred Hoiberg, you know, and just how tight this team is, um, I just feel like it's their time. Oh, yeah, I definitely want them to win for sure. I just am so used to being excited and then being let down. So that's the other part of it, too. Yeah, that makes <laughs> sense. Um, I know you're not as big into the women's basketball. Do you have any thoughts on that matchup? Have you looked at that one much? I've looked at it a little bit, and I think, you know, again, for all the talk about Alberts and, you know, things like that, I think that the women match up well with Texas A&M. I mean, I think it's going to be a tough game. Um, but at the same time, you know, we've seen – We've seen the Nebraska women's offense also be able to go on, you know, hot streaks. And, you know, their play defensively has also picked up over the last couple of weeks. And, you know, I think they could really give, you know, Texas A&M a challenge. You know, I think, you know, it's going to be able to, you know, come down to, you know, again, who's the most efficient and who can guard the best defensively on the perimeter. Um, and, you know, there have been times this season when Nebraska, when when the women's team has kind of faltered and gone up and down, but at the same time, they're still playing strong basketball right now, and I think that's going to be important moving forward. And it's also important to remember for both these teams, I think that this is a lot of for for, for a lot of them, this is their first time in the NCAA tournament, so early game jitters will play a factor, I think, as well. Yeah, and it's um, you know you look at Texas A and M and it's kind of interesting. Like they went six and ten in the SEC and still made the NCAA yeah. tournament. So that's kind of you know shows you that how much respect the committee gives the uh, SEC, which does have a lot of loaded teams. You know about it. Defensive rating, um, you know, points per possession is uh, eight, basically uh, 0.8. So they give up 0.82 points per possession, which is really good, twenty eighth in the country. 
Um, their three point defense is also very good. They, um, you know, allow just 29% makes. Um, they allow just 40% on two point attempts, uh, 37% overall. So those are all basically in the top 50, uh, except their three point defense is 100th, but still pretty solid. Um, so, you know, basically to me, it's going to come down to their, but the thing is, their offense is terrible. Their offense is just not very good. They're 295th and three point percentage. Um, you know, their overall shooting percentage is 158th. They are 118th in scoring. So they're not a great scoring team. So I feel like basically, you know, for Nebraska to win this game, they just need to get, you know, a good a good outing from Jazz Shelley. And then uh, I think a, a big key is going to be Alexis, um, you know, Markowski down low. Can they get her going? Can she get a double-double? Because when she gets going, that seems to really open things up, you know, on the perimeter as well. So, I mean, I just feel like defensively they're um, – pretty evenly matched and i just feel like nebraska has the two best you know offensive players on their side of the floor and jazz shelley and alexis markowski and i think that'll make the difference and i think that's why nebraska will uh, move on in advance neither of these teams were in the ncaa tournament last year so um they're both both ex they're both veteran veteran teams but like you said there's, there's going to be some jitters and i just think you know nebraska's been on this you know big been in the big stage against caitlin clark i don't think they're gonna you know be intimidated by this matchup at all and I just think that, you know, Jazz Shelley and Markowski will get them over the hump today. Well, in addition to Shelley and Markowski, Natalie Potts and, and you know, Logan Nisley, they also scored in double figures. So I think, you know, as much as, you know, Shelley and Markowski are going to need to have a big game, they also need to have, you know, players like Potts and Nisley also step up and, you know, this team, when it's firing on all cylinders, you know, they have, you know, four or five players that can score in double figures. And I think it's going to take another effort like that tonight. And, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see, uh, you know, how efficient they are from from beyond the arc. I mean, they weren't terrible in the last game against Iowa. They were 14 to 34. Um but, you know, Shelley went 3 of 10 from beyond the arc, and Nisley went 4 of 10. I'd like to see that number, you know, maybe go up to 5 of 10 and se or 7 of 10 for uh, Nisley. But, you know, I think the three ball is going to be important in this game. And, um, you know, I think if they as, – as long as they execute and limit the turnovers and get everybody involved, I like Nebraska's, you know, chances to win – Tonight, I I honestly feel a little bit more confident about the women than I do the men. But you know, I I, I think just when you get the women rolling with the amount of scoring talent that they have, you know, they're extremely difficult to stop. And the same could be said about the men. But you know, I think I think the women have the upper hand in their matchup a little bit more. Yeah, I could agree with that. Um, I think the women's team. Um, I I do think that they you know deserve a number six seed and um. Yeah, I think that they have a chance to make a, a run in this tournament. I think their defense um, is very good. And um, so, yeah, it's going to be interesting, both teams, I think. And you look at, you know, Nebraska, what's interesting about Nebraska and Texas A&M, the men's matchup, too, is like Bart Torvik. I don't know if anybody, you know, follows his rankings, but he basically does like, you know, he did a ranking of who was the best, who were the best teams in college basketball over the last 10 games of the season. I think Nebraska was like the seventh best team and Texas A&M was like number nine. So that tells you right now, both teams are playing really well. So I think we're going to see a really exciting game, um, a stressful game on, uh, on Friday night. So tune you know in for that. there are any watch parties um, for either of the games tonight? I, I've been asked that a couple times and I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know if there are or not. I wouldn't, uh, I'm going to keep looking for those who watch um, before the games. I'm going to keep looking, and then I'll post something on the pages. But I haven't seen anything yet. Yeah, I haven't seen anything either. Um, yeah, maybe they'll have I'm – sure, I'm sure there's something going on in Lincoln or, or whatever. But, uh, yeah, yeah, not that I've anything. Yeah. Um, so, anyway, <clears throat> I know we spent most of our episode here on, uh, you know, the, the basketball games coming up tonight. But there was some huge news uh, this week. Um, with Troy Dannon being named of the athletic director, obviously a new president and all that stuff too. But, um, but yeah, I want to focus on the the AD hire. So, what what were your thoughts when you this news popped up? I guess Wednesday morning, um, where, when Troy Dannon, you know, was hired kind of out of nowhere to replace Trev Alberts. I like it. You know, I think um, you know he hired Willie Fritz. He got Jed Fish to Washington. He's been on the NCAA football oversight um, and competition committees. Um, you know, he also, uh, worked, 
in the state of Nebraska, and he has a relationship with Matt Rule. And I think all of those things are really strong. Um, a lot of people are saying, oh, he only spent six months at Washington. Don't give him too much credit. But at the same time, you know, I think um, he was able to kind of help stabilize Washington a little bit. So, you know, I guess if you want to look at his accomplishments, look at more at what he did at Tulane. And right now Tulane has emerged as, you know, one of the top 25 programs in the country. And so even if people don't want to credit him for Washington, I definitely give him credit for his work uh, with Tulane. And so I think it's a really strong hire. Um, I think it's a really strong hire. I don't know too much about the president, but I know that the president was a guy that Trev wanted. So, I mean, we'll, we'll see how everything shapes up, but I'm very excited by the potential. And uh, with Dan and Ant, he's already at the basketball games today. So, you know, he's already uh, he's already starting his new job in full swing. What a time to come in, right? You get to you get to be announced as the athletic director, and all of a sudden you're down at the NCAA tournament ready to support the team. So. And I think I want to say that Amy just said that was before his contract even like truly kicked in. So I don't even think he's like just going down there because he wants to be there and support the team. So, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I feel like that some people, you know, you can find a negative in anything if you they want. They like to but complain. That's what I realized. They like but to complain. The thing is, okay, here's my thing about, uh, you know, Dan is that he's from Iowa. He's at Northern Iowa. So, yeah, being at a place like Nebraska is going to appeal to him more than, say, Seattle. I mean, that's two completely different places. Like, I'm not just like climate. I mean, everything. And so, yeah, he was maybe he was there for six months. And it's like, yeah, you know, I don't like being rained on all the time. Or I don't I'm you know, I don't like fish. I don't know. But th there's a lot of reasons why, people, <laughs> you know, like if you're from the Midwest, I mean, Seattle is a very different place than Iowa or Nebraska. So. Um, I mean, just from that perspective, it's not that surprising that, you know, yeah, if he sees an opportunity to go, you know, where he wants to be, um, he said that to the team last night and then he put his money where his mouth is because his contract has a $12.5 million buyout after the first year. So that tells you right there. He's not going anywhere. You guys like he's, his is, he's got very steep buyouts on his contract. Go look it up. Um, but somebody that's looking to move on, you know, isn't going to agree to a $12.5 million buyout after like the first year. So he's not leaving anywhere, especially, you know, early. Um, it, it, I think it's a home run hire. You know, he's been on, yeah. you know, a lot of the football committees. I think it's just, I mean, and somebody, I mean, look, he doesn't need any schooling at all in the big 10. Like, I mean, to take him from another big 10 program, I, I think it's a, it's a home run hire and, and people that are, are down on, it, I think they just want to, you know, you you are those people that want to just complain about you know anything basically. They so, revel you know, in Nebraska's misery, but somehow yeah. are still Nebraska fans. Yeah, it's like uh, There's a lot of them. Yeah, just like come on, people. Like the sun will come out tomorrow, and uh, this is this is a good move. So we don't have to be so uh, you know cynical about everything. But at any rate, well. It's interesting you mentioned the heavy buyouts because there's also a heavy buyout in Fred Hoiberg's new contract. So they're, Nebraska's trying to make long-term investments, and if people leave, they're going to make them pay. I don't really think Albert's had to really pay too much. He just got up and left. Um, but He did have to pay. They did have to pay like $4 million, um, but That's which, some change. Which, uh, but, yeah, but it still helps them uh, yeah. pay because Dannon's buyout was like $1.5 million. So basically – Trev leaving covered Dannon's buyout plus some of his, you know, salary. So, I mean, at least they were able to, you know, like Tom Osborne said, get people here that want to be here. Dannon wants to be here. I support him. Trev can go to hell. Yeah. So that's, I don't want to speak Trev Albert's name ever yeah. again. <laughs> except, <laughs> if they, except if they ever try to welcome him back to the field, I'm going to be like trumpeting the reason to, you know, like let's, let's celebrate the 1993 team, but not have Trev Alberts be there. Cause he, I would almost rather welcome Scott Frost <laughs> back before I welcome uh, Trev Alberts. I mean, yeah, no, I, that's the thing, Scott, he, you know, he could have, he could have done other things, but you know, he just was, he just was incompetent. You know, that was, that, that wasn't his fault. That's like when, you know, that's like when Pam Beasley, you know, quits the office and she tries to join the Michael Scott paper company. And she's like, you don't put a child in charge. That's, that's, you know, it was whoever put Scott Frost in charge is to blame for that. Not Scott Frost. And quite honestly, if I was Scott Frost, one of the highest power position jobs in the state, I'd be having margaritas and not showing up to recruiting meetings too. So I can't even sit on my high horse and act like I wouldn't be doing the same thing, but there you go. That's why I'm not head football coach at Nebraska. <laughs> Dan Danny would be partying instead of uh, recruiting. <laughs> well, there's a game today. Yeah. Well, there's a go. Oh, better get ready. Um, 
Anyway, so we, we you talked on, touched on it a little bit. I wanted to just hit a, a few uh, quick news points here before we wrap things up. But um, new contract extensions for Fred Hoiberg and Amy Williams through the 2028-29 seasons. Um, you know, I know Michigan had a job opening. I don't think that that really played into the factor at all. I don't think Fred was leaving Mi Nebraska for Michigan, but I do think maybe it you know added a little bit of urgency yeah. to it just to just to make sure. Um, in terms of, man, if you guys aren't following the Nebraska baseball team, like get on the train because they are rolling right now. Five they might need another years. contract extension there too. Yeah, for Will Bolt. They've won, uh, I believe, 12 out of 14 games yeah. now, I want to say. Um, five in a row. Will Walsh was dynamic the other night. Um, no, uh, I think no runs in six innings of work, nine strikeouts. Um, so the offense has been producing. But Rob Childress really has been – you know, everything that he was kind of built up to be on that pitching staff or, or the, as the pitching coach, I should say. And it's finally coming together for Will Bull, right? We thought this might happen last year. It never really broke out or the year before. Now we're starting to see the returns and boy, are they playing well. And it's really great to see because, you know, I wasn't necessarily down on Will Bolt and I, and I hated to see him struggle, but, you know, something, you know, he needed to have a big year this year and he's definitely having it. Um, last thing to touch on, um, it's the NCAA wrestling tournament this weekend. So Nebraska taking part in that yesterday was day one. Um, so Nebraska's in sixth place right now. There's seven guys that advanced to the quarterfinals. Unfortunately, our, our boy Nash Hutchmaker is not one of them. Um, he actually did get knocked out of the tournament, um, lost in the first round and lost in consolation. So um, disappointing, but still a great run for Nash, yeah. you know, um, now get to, uh, Get focused on getting that uh, 40, 50 pounds back on you, buddy, and let's get ready for uh, August. <laughs> I know, for real. And, you know, it's just it's just crazy. I mean, I'm sure he'll be able to get that back in no time. And, yeah, you know, it's just I can't believe we're almost in April. We're talking about August. And it just one other cool kind of nugget, seeing, seeing Riola and Kalen throw at the pro day was really kind of cool. So that was cool. Um, I did want to say with wrestling, uh, Ridge Lovett, the number one ranked wrestler, he's into the quarterfinals. Um, and then let's just see Caleb Smith um, is in. He actually upset the number two seed in his bracket. Um, so that was a, a big upset. Brock Hardy's in the quarterfinals. Peyton Robb is in the quarterfinals. Andrell Taylor, um, Lenny Pinto, and Silas Allred. So seven guys in the quarterfinals. Um, that'll be, I think those are today. And then um, I believe the championship matches are on Saturday. I'll have to double check though. Um, maybe they might even be on Sunday. I'm not, I, I haven't been, a, I, I do follow wrestling, but I don't know it that well to know like how their format works. But some point this weekend, um, I do expect uh, Ridge Lovett to be wrestling and hopefully win a national championship. Busy weekend, busy weekend. And uh, we'll try to maybe have a post game stream after the uh, basketball game tonight, possibly. Yeah, potentially. We'll see how it all, we'll see how everything works out with the, uh, working at home and the, the children situation. So we'll have yeah. to play that by ear, but potentially we'll either have a chat tonight, sometime tonight or tomorrow with the tomorrow with morning. Our right? Yeah. Tomorrow morning. If we don't get it tonight, we'll be there here tomorrow morning. So we can hopefully revel uh, in our success and not be uh, drowning our sorrows tonight. Because boy, have we gotten used to the ladder and it's not a good time, but it's yeah. a good time until the next morning. And then you wake up with a big headache and it's not fun. I can't de I can't deal with that. I'm not ready for the season to end. So I'm gonna be very sad if it does no. and uh hopefully it doesn't. But uh Welcome to March. It feels good to say that, huh? Yeah, it is. Yeah, we, we sleep in April, as John Rothstein likes to say. <laughs> but but now Final Four is in April. I don't think it really applies anymore. <laughs> yeah, you're right. So yeah. at any rate, um, thanks for joining us, you guys. Uh keep an eye out for our next stream, either be tonight or tomorrow morning. And as always, uh go big red. Go big red.